uh, Kurt and uh, Brian are going to give talks tonight. Okay. So this will start with Kurt. Yeah, then I have several friends who aren't named Bob. Hi guys. So I am basically just bringing you up to speed on some of my HPC Linux work uh, as kind of a place to shoo my stuff in around Brian's work and also the fact that we had an opening this week. I, I only really have about a half an hour worth of updates for you. Um, but we, um, I know there's some folks here that go to the HPC GPU meetups. We, we've been kind of inconsistent on those. Um, <clears throat> it's a lot harder to get into Microsoft Nerd these days. I don't know if you guys have been over to any, any meetings over there. But now they actually require you to sign in, which is, I don't want to get on those mailing lists. So, but I will, I will bring up to speed on what I'm working on. The, um, you'll notice the, this, this open sock off. So, so sock is the, is the latest and greatest buzzword in the high performance computing community. Because with system on chips, you can get a big payoff in the, the, the place that you get the biggest payoff is in the shared memory swap off. I mean, I'll talk to you about one or two of these projects that are listed up on my SOC slide. Um, so this, this is, I'd say, a, a kind of a hot contemporary topic at the HPC conferences probably dating maybe a year ago. There's been plenty of business uh, in SOCs. Uh, system on chips and Knox network on chips, um, but they haven't really made much of a foray into high performance computing or high throughput computing um, until recently. High performance computing is uh, the paradigm where you want to get more out of your compute, more out of your CPU than you do out of your network. High throughput computing or is what the big data guys are looking at a lot now, is how to get the maximum uh, Network performance out of out of your out of your uh, stack. So so those are usually called NOX or uh, or HPTs or HTP high throughput computer high throughput performance HPC HTC yes. Um, so the the socks I've been using uh, if if you've come to some of Brian's and my um, embedded lectures from from previous months. I've been using this, the, the Samsung Exynos 5 family for quite a while now. The, that family of chips is it's a it's Samsung single die, single package product that has four ARM Cortex A15s and four ARM Cortex uh, A7s, I think. Uh, it's the A15s and the A7s, yeah. So the A15s are the ones I care about because they're uh, ARM V7, uh, they've got neon on them so I can do some vector math, 32-bit. Uh, um, so so that's, that's kind of the, the high watermark of the ARM V7 family is the ARM Cortex A15. And the Exynos 5 family from Samsung, uh, you get at least four of them. Uh, so if you've got four of each, if you've got the low power ones and the high power ones, you can run the big little paradigm that ARM is espousing now. And Samsung has its own kind of spin on it. They call it uh, um, H HMA instead of, uh, uh, and I don't quite have that acronym right, that TLA right either. Uh, let me uh, think about that. Um, HMP, hybrid multiprocessor. So, so with big little kernels, you can adaptively spin up and down frequencies per core. Say, you, say you're using something like Slurm as your queuing uh, package. There's a, some modules now in, in these queuing systems that will be able to determine whether the job needs to go to the low power, low frequency cores or the high power cores. You can set it up so that it, you've got a heterogeneous mix of cores. It's, a, it's pretty cool. I haven't found yet the killer demonstration app that'll show you why Big Little is better than, than what preceded it, which was just pegging all four cores uh, to performance or to uh, low power uh, or something. If, if low power is, is your goal, then you can dial back the frequencies. You can either do it at the command line, you know, CPU freak info, C, CPU freak set, which you can download now uh, in either the you know, RPM or app-based uh, distros. Um, so why uh, why SOC is uh, 
a predecessor to HPC now is <coughs> it's not just the ARM licensees of the world that are looking at socks. <coughs> there's a, as you probably know, there's two kinds of ARM licensees. There's the guys with the with the license that, that lets them use the cores, uh, the, 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 the straight ARM licensed cores in whatever their processor is going to be. And then you've got people with architectural licenses that can that can get the, uh, the EDL or uh, the Verilog or uh, the source sources, probably the HDL or Verilog from ARM and be able to modify it to suit their own purposes. Now, that's a fairly well-kept secret who has architectural licenses, but I have to figure Apple has an ARM architectural license because they've got an ARM V8 or part of an ARM V8 implementation on, on the new iPhone. And so ARM V8 processors are starting uh, to, to be seen in the wild. You can get an ARM V8 dev board from, uh, uh, you, you, can, you can certainly request from, from AMD now. They have a website where you can request an ARM V8 dev board. Their, their processor, it's a target at the server markets called Seattle. Uh, I haven't seen one of those yet, but I suspect they'll be in, in general availability next month. Uh, there is the uh, X-Gene. Um, uh, you can get a dev board from X, for X-Gene. Now I have seen that. I have logged into that. That's the big difference between ARMv8 and ARMv7 is the 64-bit um, uh, availability. Uh, so I can't tell you, because these are just dev boards right now and they're very hard to get hold of, I can't tell you what the performance trade-offs between ARMv7 and ARMv8 or, or some of these other remixes. The ARM V7s I'm using right now, and this is one of the socks that I'm, I'm really jazzed up about, is the uh, NVIDIA Tegra K1. So the NVIDIA Tegra K1 comes on this dead, dead board called Jetson. So you, you go down to Micro Center here and get a Jetson for 192 bucks. It's 192 bucks because there's 192 CUDA cores in it and uh, four ARM Cortex-A15s. So you've got a nice, a really healthy HPC CPU base, and then you've got NVIDIA's CUDA cores. So, so you install CUDA 6, um, and you can do some very interesting things with the shared memory. This was this this in-package shared memory thing is kind of what the UMA capabilities of CUDA 6 are for, so that you can do uh, don't have to do another malloc or CUDA malloc to, uh, to, to move the, the data around. No PCI bus, it's just, it's just a context switch on, your, on, the, on the core memory. I think it's DDR3 on these Jetsons. But, uh, so there's, there's already a halfway decent paper talking about CUDA 6 UMA capabilities at the, uh, at the HPEC conference website, which like I say was last month. That's where this presentation came from. Um, I'll, at the end of this presentation, I'll show you some links to it. And then by about this time next month, I'll run a bunch of uh, the Jetson uh, similar benchmarks uh, to show what, what the Jetson boards can do with CUDA 6 other uh, UMA capability. The other, the other benchmarks that have been run have been with traditional systems with, with discrete CPUs and discrete GPUs, um, NVIDIA, uh, Intel and NVIDIA. Um, these, so I threw a couple of the uh, uh, the existing sock projects on this slide. This this rubric, this is kind of an umbrella project here, the Open Sock. So Open Sock, if you if you Google it, it'll bring you to a site that will talk about their their particular implementation of the system on chip, their VHDL lang or their their uh, meta language chisel, so that you can generate your own uh, designs and. Uh, uh, this has a, a lot of backing with uh, the HPC community that's, that's at the Department of Energy. They're very interested in the open source project. And RISC V, RISC V is, is the OS that they'd like to have run on this. Um, low risk is, uh, this is an initiative that's got support from, uh, from Buddy Huang from MIT. I don't know who else is involved with low risk. That's lowrisk.org if you want to Google that. They're probably not as far along as the OpenSock project. Um, but 
they're also interested in risk five uh, as their own. So, uh, so what's good about a lot of these these embedded risk CPUs is they're all 64-bit. I think I think each one of these projects uh, is 64-bit. Well, Adaptiva isn't. Um, I think I think you guys know a lot about the Adaptiva project. We've had them talk here. Um, so. I've been saying for a little while, at least as long as it's been as, as long as it's been ringing true, that uh, that Exascale goes through EEHPC, which goes through embedded. A couple of years ago, um, a professor from uh, Notre Dame, uh, Professor Cody, was the lead author on an Exascale report, and they talked about some of the fundamental changes in the data center and supercomputing paradigm that would have to get fixed before we'll get to Exascale. And it turns out that a lot of the new horizons in, in computational uh, science, scientific discovery are, are going to need an Exascale supercomputer to, uh, to, to get to where we, where we need to be. So, so that's not good because we, uh, we have these plateaus now. These, uh, um, I think I'll make the on my next slide. Uh, we, we have certainly uh, say uh, 20 petaflops supercomputers kind of the top of the line right now. Uh, we're, we're starting to plateau off in, in ways that, that, are, that are Moore's Law uh, 45 degree angle graph has, you know, has it in previous years. We've had, it's been kind of, the top, the top 10 supercomputers represent 50% of the performance of the top 500. And, uh, and that's not good. That means that, that there's not enough innovation going on in the, in the missing middle and in the, uh, in the HPC community to, to keep us on, the, um, on, on Moore's Law tracking. If not Moore's Law, then, then some sort of Moore's Law tracking model where we're getting, we're getting these, these exponential benefits out of the subsystems of the network and, and graphics and things like that. We're, we're certainly not getting those. Um, I'm not going to tell you that Moore's Law is going to die, uh, it's, it, but I will tell you that as soon as we get down to sub-7 nanometer processes, uh, you have quantum effects and you know, uh, things happening down at that level which we haven't really assessed to figure out if we're going to be able to, to maintain uh, transistor density at, at, at those processes. So, so what I've discussed with uh, with Brian and some other folks, we the top 500 comes out November 18th, I think. It comes out at the, the second or third day of supercomputing, where they list the top 500 supercomputers in the in the world by raw performance, and then the day after, um, also at the supercomputing conference, they they reveal the green 500 list, which is substantially a remix of the top 500 list. Uh, as, as a uh, measure of energy efficiency, uh, where they get the uh, they get the measured power of the supercomputer, and then of course they've got the, the peak performance and average performance um, of the of the supercomputers. You can you can submit uh, things to the Green 500 list if if you don't have enough raw performance to submit to do a formal submit to the top 500 list. But but what I what I'm going to discuss with the HPEC community, the high performance embedded community, and see if the HPC community is interested, is, is a, a third denominator, uh, which is um, volume, or area. Area is a proxy for volume. So the, the folks, one of the partners of the Open Compute Project is Goldman Sachs. And Goldman Sachs says at the Open Compute Summits, we have 20 data centers and we ain't gonna buy any more. So that's, that's kind of a charter for the HPC community to go out and make things denser uh, while they're still walking along with these Moore's Law following uh, technologies to make things better performing and less power and cheaper. So, so it's, uh, it's, I think Seymour Cray used to have a quote, you know, better, faster, cheaper, pick two. Well, some of these customers are demanding three now. And, uh, if, if it's too expensive to hire uh, people to come in in the middle of the night on a beeper and, and swap out disks, or to go to the Columbia River Basin and build a new data center, 
then now we've got a third, a third uh, paradigm that, that we're going to have to shoehorn this design into. So the payoff for us HPC and HPEC folks is, this is, seems to me to be clearly the path to exit scale. If we can keep reducing things, you know, in the old days when you had a CPU and a discrete floating point, and now it's all on the same chip. You know, if we keep putting stuff into the same package, right, right now we've got the CPU and the GPU, which is great for us HPC folks who use CUDA. If we can keep putting things onto that die and keep moving the model of the, the discrete system into a, into a system on chip, this is probably the path to exascale. We need to, you know, see a few more of these SOC designs, see how, how well they, they perform in, in the dozen or so uh, most popular HPC codes that uh, academia and, uh, and the national labs use. But I think that's, I think that's the, uh, I think that's the direction. Certainly that's the direction HPEC is going to go. The predominant uh, number of presentations at HPEC, uh, the conference here in, in Waltham this year, were, were people using some sort of a, some sort of a SOC-based design. Um, <clears throat> I don't have much more. You're, you're welcome to ask me. I, I apologize. I, I, I thought I was going to have all sorts of cool new socks to show you, but we may have to wait for Federico. Federico buys one of everything, mm -hmm. so <laughs> so he may have um, he may have one of these. Uh, Brian found this thing called an all winner. Uh, uh, it, it appears to be an ARM V8 based dev board. Um, here again, uh, maybe they've got an architecture from li uh, license from ARM. But it's, it's very hard to tell. Certainly ARM won't tell. Um, so I'm pretty much done. Why, why are they not public about licensing? So they're public ab about uh, the, the tier two licensing. You can find out who, like Samsung is a, is a non-architectural licensee. Um, one of the things you can do with an ARM architecture license is, is just basically drop the word ARM and call it, you know, whatever you want. I think this board uh, that Charbax was telling us about is called the Noble 64, and uh, no mention of ARM anywhere there. But if you read the spec sheet, it's pretty clear. Um, I don't know why you wouldn't want to use the term ARM if you were an ARM architecture licensee, because there are plenty of companies coming out with, with MIPS processors these days. The first, uh, the first yarn hay was, was a MIPS processor based supercomputer. I don't think the current one is, the A2. Uh, and that's right at the top of the top 500 list. Um, one of the Japanese supercomputers uh, was... You mean the K? Am I pronouncing it right? You mean the K supercomputer from Fujitsu, I guess. I'm, I'm Chinese, so I don't know pronunciation either. Oh, yeah, yeah. But I think they use some sort of Spark process. Spark, that's right, yeah. Is it Open Spark? Mm, Fujitsu's proprietary Spark 64, I guess. Oh, okay. All right, what would it And that one's called the KFC? The, the, because they rebuilt the original. Uh, Does that use a Kentucky Fried Kernel? Well, <laughs> so, so oddly enough, they, 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 use, they use some sort of oil to keep their chips cool. I think it's like mineral oil or something. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so they actually, I thought, yeah, I thought, yeah. I thought it was water. Actually. Right. You know, I said it's liquid cool, but I don't know if it's water or oil. I think it's some, some sort of oil. Wouldn't make yeah. sense to And I know the best supercomputer now, I think it's Chinese, the Tianhe 2. Yeah. It's using Intel processors. That's right, right, yeah. And Intel co-processors. I don't yeah. know how they keep this cool. Yeah, yeah. Because so, iBridge is not a very Xeon, Xeon new... Xeon Pi, right? You mean Xeon Pi, Intel co-processors. Yeah. 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 And the new, so that, and those are those are on a discrete card that goes to the PCI bus, right? right? So the new Xeon Pi, they're trying to move it to the, to the core processor. Oh, okay. And I don't know what the, I don't know, so the, the Chinese for the longest time wanted to use their processor. The Lung Su or something? Um, we have Lung Su, which is a um, MIPS processor. Which is MIPS, yeah. And we also have, I think, Phelon, which is already used on um, Ken 2 as the monitoring machines. It's based on OpenSpark. Oh, really? Yeah, but the thing is, the processing power is definitely not enough for a supercomputer. Yeah. So yeah. that's why they still use Intel chips. Yep. Yep. And I think Titan uses AMDs and VDs, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, I'm sorry because I'm, I'm just a high school student. I don't know that much about supercomputing. <laughs> well, so so the uh, the top 500 list is is uh, it, it's going to be very interesting to see what it looks like next month. 
you know, a year ago, there were still IBM blue jeans at the top of the top of the list. Yeah, but right? a year later, I think it's re already replaced by Fujitsu and uh, Dell. Actually, yeah, Dell, you, Dell had one in, I can't remember which lab, but they seem to use Blade servers and put them into a rack. As, and it's actually a commercial server which can be ordered from Dell's website. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but I really can't understand how they keep that kind of thing's cool because my phone and my laptop gets hot oh, yeah. easily. Oh yeah. Your your system on a chip volume metric, if it isn't green, it's going to be incandescent. Yeah. <laughs> so this is one of the things that the Open Compute project was was very uh, sensitive to. One of so the Open Compute project has various research paradigms that you can bolt into. One of them is they want to revisit the design of the rack. So the rack, they, they, they have a, the open compute rack spec is 21 and a half inches, I think, for the 19 inches. So that's not as crazy as it sounds. It turns out you can, you can do some things to, to take your 19 inch traditional server and turn it into an open compute spec server. Um, but they've also looked at, at some of these power issues, like waiting until the very last moment to do your AC to DC conversion. So you can get uh, at least one of their specs talks about bringing 13, 13 point whatever KVA to the rack instead of breaking it out to 110 or 220 or something yeah, like so, that. So, um, socks, I know it's a good thing, but most, I think the most I'm worried is that it, will it get too hot? I don't know. Well, yeah, so... Because I know if the density goes up, it's going to be getting hotter. Yeah. Yep. Well, some of these socks, like um, Adaptiva's Epiphany, it, it runs at you know like 300 megahertz or something like that. So yeah, so you have to you have to find out ways to get performance without cranking up the frequency. Yeah, I know my friend had a Surface RT back in China. It uses Nvidia's Tegra Q1, and it, and it, it gets very hot. Yeah, yeah. In fact, they ship that's they they ship with these little fans on. That I forget where they got the fans from. They don't say Tigger K1 on them, they say something else. But yeah. yeah. Does he have a Jetson board? Or does he have like a. Uh, he's just a normal user, so. Yeah. So, you so he used service as a tablet with a keyboard, and then I found out it's going to get too hot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the new Chromebook has the Tigger K1 in it, too. So they're starting to show up. Um, all right. Are you ready, Brian? I don't really have much else. I can probably pull up a picture of um, I'm online. I can show you the Open Sock website. Good. That's good. good to go? Yeah, All right. Yeah, Oh, you want VGA? No, no, that's it. Oh, Brian, you're asking earlier about pastemen. About what? Pastemen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we can pass on it, though. Where? Could you get it set up? Yeah, I just created a account for it. Oh, all right. Well, maybe Steve will see if Steve wants to. Plug. We had some URLs to, uh, to sort of share. We get some servers running around the, the, the classroom here, so we can... Uh, so you can connect to it in a little bit and see how that goes. Okay, so um, we'll, we'll, we'll do this because it, it's sort of a mixed audience to figure out what uh, people are interested in. We'll, we'll sort of just, you know, adjust the, the topics accordingly. These are kind of the big topics that I kind of <coughs> prepared to talk about. And you'll see there's a bunch of uh, beagle bones that are around the room in different places and Stephen Ronan is very kindly networking them together. They're networked together via mesh, open mesh. 
So um, for folks who maybe not have had experience with Mesh, but basically the idea is that instead of going up to one big mega cloud, it kind of hops from node to node to node, and, and then eventually it gets to the mega cloud, and then it hops back, right? So that's the way Mesh works. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go. But basically the, the classroom setup here is that each of these beagle bones, and there are, I think, about, um, I think we got almost nine or 11 of them, that each one has Debian running on it, each one has a web server running on it, and a little mini application that we'll... Can I ask, yeah. what's the architecture of the Debian operating system you're running? So, it, so the, the BeagleBone runs with, it's an ARM chip, and so it's an ARM... So it's, it's another Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, right, right, right. So, so it's and it's basically Debian uh, yeah. compiled for ARM. Yeah, is Weezy or is it a? Um, it is Weezy. Ti Debian or S or something, right? Yeah, there's. Um, so if you want to learn about the the, the device, just BeagleBone.org, and it's very well documented. Uh, the, in fact, the technical systems reference manual is like, it, it's hundreds of pages. I mean, it's kind of nirvana for people who want to get in and uh, learn about the systems. And in addition, it's essentially an open hardware platform. So they uh, encourage, allow, invite people to utilize their designs in their own uh, essentially embedded applications and, and designs. Um, so you'll find out everything about the chips that are on the board, everything about the chips that's in the processor, and lots and lots of other things. It's, it's available uh, widely online. And we'll, we'll, there are some links to it and other things, but anyway, BeagleBone.org is the place to, to go for that. And in terms of the question about uh, is it Wheezy, is it Jesse, actually in the classroom we have both running uh, versions of Wheezy and Jesse, and we can talk a little, basically Wheezy is the currently shipping version uh, of, of uh, Debian, and Jesse is sort of the one that's you know, coming out. Uh, soon coming out in, in the near future. So, so these are the big topics. Uh, Dart, which is a programming language, uh, Debian BeagleBone, the Linux kernel, which pertains particularly to, well, it's, it's the core uh, commonality of people maybe in the room, but there are a lot of specific benefits to the more recent ones in particular that make it especially interesting related to the BeagleBone and, and uh, some other things. Networks we've talked about, we've got mesh running around here and we'll talk about some other, and then in general the umbrella um, uh, sort of project direction for this is whether you call it IoT, Internet of Things, Google has recently begun to advocate this terminology uh, referred to as the physical web. They've got some interesting early experimental exploratory things out there that we can talk about uh, as well. So this is kind of the, 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 the big uh, high level stuff. I have some definite conjectures about where this is going to go. We'll come back to that. Um, I just want to get really up there, uh, right up front, some, some special thanks to people from TI, the team behind the BeagleBone, as well as uh, the, the design of it, and uh, as well as the people who are building Debian for it. it just impressive stuff, and we can talk about some <coughs> anecdotes just over the past uh, interactions that I've had with them. The Dart team, which is principally, uh, you know, was created and initiated at Google, but it's an open source project, and there are people outside of Google who are participants in uh, in the code commits and all. Very impressive, you know, high octane team is kind of the way we refer to it, but world class team. And then of course Blue and Steven and Kurt have been real helpful pulling this demo together. So I just want to get a quick show of hands, hardware, people interested in hardware, people interested in software. You can hit, use both hands if you want. People interested principally in network kinds of stuff and people who are students, academics, high school counts, great, okay. Um, so we, we got, we were a little bit, uh, we've got multiple, we'll cover them all in, in depth. I think that also the other way is that it would be great for me, if you have questions to ask, I, I, uh, we don't need to drill through this stuff, I have a lot of slides, much of which might be redundant, but we can go to different levels. Uh, basically the stuff that we have running here on these devices, and, and this is, uh, this is kind of like a little homebrew project here that brings a lot of this stuff together, right? So. There, there's a BeagleBone. This is actually one of the earlier versions of the BeagleBone that beautifully still runs the, uh, the, the latest versions of Debian on it. So they've maintained great compatibility. Uh, and, and the nice thing about like Raspberry Pi or uh, other devices, you know, Galileo from Intel and, and many, many other things, right, uh, that perhaps all have their 
their own unique user interfaces and APIs and things like that. It's basically like little le electronics projects. And you wire them together. This particular one has, uh, has essentially a motion sensor, buzzer, beeper, and uh, LED lights. And then you install the software on the BeagleBone. And it can be C++, or it can be Python, or it can be, as we'll see, Dart. Uh, and you get the applications running on the board. And then uh, you can connect to it via SSH or, yeah, question. So how is it different than a Raspberry Pi? So I'll, gi I'll give you the short, skinny on it. And uh, you know, don't want to bias you either way. If you have Raspberry Pi, that's great. You can do a lot of common things with this board and with Raspberry Pi. Lots of projects that I've done basically with the Bigel Bone have been based on designs that have appeared in the Raspberry Pi. So I guess my top five would be, and I don't want to get into a religious debate on this because that's just not what I'm, I'm interested in, but um, the things I like about the Bigel Bone. One, it's, it's much more open source, I think, than the Raspberry Pi. Two, uh, you can, for instance, download the latest versions of Debian as opposed to a particular spin for the, for the platform, Raspbian, you know. Um, so it's kind of Debian, Debian, Debian. And uh, three, it's got a lot of horsepower on this board. And uh, that, you know, so, so those are kinds of the things, performance, compatibility, openness, versatility. That's why I kind of like to. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. Jessica. Make sure. So, is Pikachu using a newer version of ARM chips like ARM version 7 or ARM version 8 compared to Raspberry Pi's ARM version 6? So, I, I, and I, I, Kurt, you're, you're, yeah. so, you're the expert. It's better than the Raspberry Pi, but worse than the Tegra. Yeah. It's, so, it's, it's no better than ARM Cortex A9. It's using the V7, I say. So the Raspberry Pi uses the V6. Yeah, so Raspberry Pi uses a very old African ARM version 6 and yeah. cause problem for both that <coughs> and RCX. Right, right. So that's a big reason why, you know, I, that, that um, if, if you want, like early on, there were some compatibility issues with certain things that I was interested in. So, so this is the direction I'm headed. Anyways, they're all great, you know, uh, devices to work with. But as you can see here, we've got a room full of, of video phones. Um, so Dart, real high level stuff, uh, programming language, familiar to anybody who's done any programming in C or Python or BASIC or, you know, you pick it, easy to learn. The beauty of it, one of the great beauties of it is that you can use one language for developing applications that run on servers, essentially command line, console based, things that can do file I.O. and access the web. But also, you can develop applications that, uh, essentially they have a translation capability that exports into JavaScript. And so you use the same language, basically with different libraries. So instead of doing things like file I.O., you're doing things like manipulating the DOM or walking you know, through HTML documents and stuff like that. And so you're able to essentially leverage your language learning for these really diverse uh, applications. In addition, it, you know, it's very performant. It has a terrific, we'll get into it a little bit later, um, it has a good, developer environment where you can do debugging and all sorts of uh, cool stuff. Python, the demonstration that I, I have here, we probably won't have time to, to show, but um, one of the things that Dart doesn't have yet is a library that accesses the pins on the uh, BeagleBone, right? And so what, what the question is, so how do you do things like turn the lights on and off, <coughs> read the switches, <coughs> read the sensors? So with Dart. So eventually the solution hopefully will be that someone will, will develop a library that will talk natively to, and Dart has an architecture that allows they have uh, applications and integration and stuff. So you, what, mean, so you mean no no thing like the kernel firmware should be low, should be needed for talking with a bigger right? Right. right. Because I know on x86, many things, for example, my tablet's wireless card needs a firmware to be in order to make it work with the kernel. So Big one does not need this, right? Yeah, that's, and this might be um, a, a little bit uh, tangential, but one of the big things that happened, like within the past year or two, right, was this, and I, I got a slide on it, which is the, the Linus rant about um, essentially the complexity injected into the, the Linux kernel by all these ARM platforms and the manner in which they were being developed. And people, on the one hand, get, you know, with their best intentions, we're eagerly kind of going through the Linux kernel uh, and, and uh, putting in their own fixes basically for compatibility with their own SOCs, 
because they had an armed license, for instance, but they added their own little secret sauce or they did things in a slightly different way. It became wildly uh, unmanageable to the point where there was you know, this terrific rant that led to the, the, a new and better way of doing things. Only within, I think, I don't know if it was the Colonel 3 8 or something like that. But, um, and, and so now there's something called the device tree. And so instead of people essentially going in and multiple vendors having to make changes to core kernel pieces of code, uh, shared files, every SOC vendor is required to develop this device tree of which the BeagleBone, and it has a very good explanation and description of how they went about doing it. So one of the big changes, in fact, for the BeagleBone through the multiple years that it's been on the market has been to adapt to this new device tree way of doing things. And that was a bit of a blip, I think, with no personal experience with it. But, uh, you know, the BeagleBone has these things called capes. And Arduino has, like, shields at the really low end of things. And what, Raspberry Pi has, what do they call the things that you, you know, they're basically like daughter boards. Capes, maybe. I think the BeagleBone, BeagleBones are capes, and Arduinos are shields, and I'm not quite sure what the Raspberry terminology is. But, but the, the mechanism by which you marry <coughs> the board, <coughs> the capes, to the underlying BeagleBone uh, changed pretty, pretty significantly, I believe, when this device tree thing came along. But it, it, it's a much happier place now because, for instance, with the, the versions of Debian that are running here, a big part of the kernel is cross-platform. So whereas before you'd really have different kernels for every chip that was out there, now the ARM compilation that's been done on this Debian that works on the BeagleBone Actually, that core kernel would also run on many other different platforms of that chipset. So, so you don't have to reconfigure a kernel every time. That's correct. That, in, in essence, that's correct. And that simplifies things greatly. And it should accelerate the adoption and utilization of, uh, of the stuff. So, so back to the, yeah, sure. So they, they've set it up in a hardware abstraction layer? In essence, that, you know, that's the way I would view it. Yeah. But isn't that hell has been missing for some time now? So Hal, I don't know if Hal is back. Yeah. Yeah. So so the, the device tree is based, it's kind of almost like a JSON-y type of uh, it's a fairly high level board description of what's on the board. I think it's still Hal in it's some way. Yeah, Hal. It's, it's just a hardware description. So I mean, it'll tell you where like, the serial port, or it'll tell you where that is mapping the address space, how many bytes to access it with, that kind of thing. Yeah. So it's basically just your basic level. It's just the stuff that's, that you find in your like driver documentation. So it's really cool. the Let's see, this through so, an API. So, yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's basically a data structure. So, so it's more like a framework, framework so that every vendor can plug in what they have so without messing the kernel, right? Correct. 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 So you don't have to recompile the kernel for data structure. No, that, that's the thing. They want to have a single kernel image across all of these devices. You'll recompile your device from blob, but you have to rebuild the kernel. So what happens, I, I think, and clearly he's the guy who's done it, so he's, he's, he's going to, after the meeting, we can have a, you know, if you want a hands-on discussion. But basically my understanding is now what happens is the kernel boots, and when it launches, it goes out and it grabs this blob, just as he described, and, and it has an API or it has the mechanism by which it can then configure itself so that it knows what's there, okay? So it's kind of a, it's a nice way of, of um, you know, of quick starts. So back to the story about Dart and how do you get Dart to talk to these pins. Basically, one of the the capabilities of Dart, like a lot of languages, is you can uh, you can run external processes, right? Whether it's command line stuff or external applications, process run. And you, in this case, so I just stuff in a Python program, and um, and the Adafruit folks. I don't know if you're familiar with Adafruit, but if you ever bought switches or or you know little gadgets and things like that, terrific. Um, establishment in terms of getting the parts and, and all they've lived and they have a lot of great projects for all these different Raspberry Pi, BeagleBones and, and uh, Arduinos and stuff. Uh, but they developed a GPIO library that talks to these different pins from Python. It's a C library, it's open source and maybe somebody will, will uh, cross compile it for Dart. So I just basically call these little Python programs that do nothing more than uh, set and get pins, right? So it's essentially transparent. But here's the kind of the, the uh, another thing that's really nice about Dart. It's essentially fully integrated asynchronous capabilities into the language, so that so that it's essentially 
native to the language, which is beautiful. So for instance, in the world of the web, when you go off and you say, get me uh, you know, the homepage from CNN, it's an asynchronous task. You don't want to wait for all the graphics and text and content to come back to you. You want to send it off, and JavaScript, of course, you know, does this wonderfully. Uh, you want to send it off, and when it's done, you want to be notified, or you want to be notified when the next step is ready to run. So Dart has this really thoroughly uh, integrated into the fabric of the language so that, for instance, File.io can be run as, as uh, asynchronous tasks. Of course, the web stuff can be run as asynchronous tasks. And uh, in this case, access to the pins, basically you launch the Python program, and when the Python program is done, then you uh, pick up what the results are from, in my case, I either have set a pin or of, uh, I'm getting the value of a pin. And then once that occurs, you then carry on with your program. So uh, it's, it's essentially, it's not exactly interrupt driven, but, but uh, hopefully you get the idea. So some of the other stuff that, we've, uh, th that has been uh, done on this is just with C++. So it runs C++ beautifully. There's like lots of good stuff out there. You can uh, cross compile from the comfort of your x86 you know, Ubuntu uh, platform, or you can just compile it natively right on the, the... And so most of the stuff that I've done has been uh, OpenCV related types of things. And, and uh, Debian, we've talked about Debian. How many people use Debian? How many people use Ubuntu? I use, I use Seed on my, old, on my laptop. You use? Seed. Debian Seed. <coughs> Debian Seed? Yeah, but... Oh. Uh, but, but what is that? What's Debian Seed? Uh, Debian Unstable. Oh, oh Debian okay. So, so Ubuntu, anything else? What, what else? <coughs> Arch. Mint? Arch? Arch. Um, a student project I got by myself is called called Anton OS, which is basically LFS <coughs> plus a bu APT and plus a bunch of things. Similar to Debian, but and also Arch, but not quite the same. Yeah. Good. CentOS seems to be popular in HPC. CentOS. Because I guess the drivers are stable. Interesting. Yeah. CentOS and SUSE, I guess they're working. Any RTOS or robotic stuff? Or <coughs> no, okay. Roz, man. Roz, Roz, okay. Roz. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's, um, so that's the, that's the broad landscape, okay? And, and uh, we can vector off in a bunch of different areas. But to me, the Internet of Things is, you know, it's, it's made up of these fundamental components, right? Uh, so you've got software, hardware, <coughs> networks. We've got them all right here today. And interactive things that, that, that uh, we'll, I guess we'll talk more about that. So this, has anybody heard about this, the physical web? Have you seen that pop up in your inbox? So about a week or two ago, so yeah, we get one. Uh, the, the, the uh, a guy who's at Google uh, uh, in product design basically articulated this concept of, of the physical web. And he basically says that it's, you know, really where we're headed is this IoT stuff, this the physical web. It's, it's about uh, URLs and not apps. And his point is that as devices essentially become smart or intelligent, then instead of having, let's say you walk through a store or this classroom, and every one of these nodes, the way we've, we've set it up, is that they serve different functions. Okay, so let me just see if I can quickly. <coughs> so here, for instance, is one of the nodes uh, that, oops, that is out here somewhere, and Stephen might be able to point to it, um, that, that essentially it's, uh, and it would be, let's be daring, Stephen, what do you think, what, should we try 15? Or? Um, try 4, 5, 5, 7, 8. So what in it that's pressed let's let's not pressure push our luck anymore. So we have two or two for two. Okay. So so what he's got a whole list. So so what Steven has done here is he's got this mesh network of all these things, right? They're meshed together. So even though each of the Beagle bones has Ethernet, right, natively, but he's got it plugged into this open mesh device, which essentially you know, meshes them together, right? And each one of them is running a uh, a web server written in Dart, and and this laptop that we're Windows laptop that we're showing this stuff from is also connected to that mesh network, right? So it's not connected to the MIT network, but but the mesh network. And so what we did was we just jumped to another node on that mesh network, and uh, we hit the web server, and all we did is said, "Give us your you know the index file." But the point is that, and, and where it becomes interesting from the physical web perspective, things. 
is that 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 uh, for instance this this little device here it's got a it's it's got a motion detector on it right and so when you walk up to it it activates and it tells this device that there's someone present now the 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 design of the physical web, at least my understanding of it as it's been written up, uh, is to essentially respond to beacons via Bluetooth BLE, Bluetooth Low Energy, right? So the idea, just like the iBeacon stuff from Apple, you walk up to a, you know, a shelf in a retail store and it knows that you're there because you've got your phone set up to, uh, <coughs> to, to essentially express your interest in that, in that, that communication somehow. And then the, the, the kicker in the physical web design is that Bluetooth low energy, which this hasn't been worked out yet, but they're kind of, this is the, 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 the plan, uh, would then transmit a URL in a very similar fashion, I think, to what we've just done, which is that we've identified a device, we've sent it a URL, and that device has sent us back, in this case it's just an image and simple text, but there's no reason it couldn't send back uh, more you know, complicated information, or more personalized information. I guess well. you can actually write an RPC or something like that with Dart, and then you can even automatically do things like transactions, right? Right, right. So, so, and, and, and exactly. So, you know, you potentially could do transactions. You certainly could do personalization of a lot of stuff. And the insight that they, they've got behind this physical web thing about why it's not apps but it's URLs is the, just the sheer complexity of installing apps from all over the place onto the phones. Flip side of it is it's kind of nice to own the URL, right? But the, the other beauty of that is that the URLs are essentially infinite in, uh, you know, in, in their ability. So what we tried to do was set up a, a somewhat of a mock simulation of how that might work in practice. And what we have here is just basically each one of these things, uh, not only can you SSH into it, but you can also, it's got apps running on it. Okay. So we kind of talked about this. We've got different, uh, we'll, at some point, Stephen, we'll, we'll tell them where the, these SSIDs are, if they haven't found them already, which they, they may well have. Um, so kind of what we did, the way we built this thing was, we, we hooked them all together, we ran Nmap on it, thanks to Kurt's systems foo, and we, we mapped the MAC addresses on these devices to the, the IP addresses that showed up, and then we uh, rolled those IP addresses basically into the, the application. So essentially what you have here is you've got a mini local network, right? It's not connected to the big cloud, but there's no reason it couldn't be bridged in some fashion. <coughs> we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So the, the application that you have running is the same application on each one of the devices? Yeah, good, good question. Um, so, it, yes and no. It's a little bit of a cheat. So, what I, basically each d device is slightly different by just simply the picture that comes up. So, the picture that comes up, you know, this is the printer, this is the bus stop, this is the loading dock, this is the... So, the framework for the application is the same, but the content that's delivered is different. And the, the simulation, the abstraction of that is that um, if I walked up and I'm interested in the loading dock, that's what I want. Yeah. So, so the, the framework, you might say, the web server component, it actually is the same. It's, it's written in Dart, and it's actually something that I just pulled out of something else that, that I had. So, so do, do the devices know about each other? Good, very good question. Um, say more. Ask more. Well, do they, do they I guess, do they have Wi-Fi and recognize each other? So the question would be, what for? Do, do, you know, do, there's no reason they couldn't, for instance, right? Um, there's no reason they couldn't collaborate, for instance. Uh, they, they, it's interesting you asked this, actually, because one, one of the alternative configurations that we had was with uh, a virtual LAN, right? Where you have you know, multiple SSIDs, but essentially they're segregated so that, in fact, if you're on this virtual LAN, you can't talk to this other virtual LAN. So you can, you know, you can design things in such a way, uh, which you may want to do, to prohibit that kind of cross, cross talk. But currently, the way these devices work, they're they're essentially separate. Or you could do it the other way. You could whitelist everything. You could put a little script together that would go out and ARP and find everybody's IP address and construct a host list for you and stuff like that. 
And I can see, certainly, the open mesh crowd loves doing stuff like that. Loves automatically integrating new meshes. Yeah, actually, if we can incorporate something using the HPC platforms like Open and PI, we can actually build a bunch of devices that can use the MPI, MPI interface to top of each other and um, how you say, scale their jobs yep. and do whatever you need. For example, you can run one of the boards as an EAP server. So when, you when your laptop, I assume it has an NFC, touches the EAP server, it can automatically do the authentication of your Wi-Fi network. Yep. So Open MP, if you want to do high performance computing, doing Open MPI on, on RMV 7 level boards is probably not the direction you want to go. But yes, you can do it. So, and that's a very good point, actually, too, that, that you got to remember these are lightweight pieces of hardware, right? They're, you know, generally speaking, pretty inexpensive. And so, the more you add on, it, you have to decide is that, you know, is that the best means? There may, in fact, be reasons why you want to have them talk together. But you certainly will start to see things, you know, bogged down potentially. Uh, this is just the, you know, the bookshelf, right? So if you really want to kind of do this stuff, there are a lot of resources available. Uh, it, it's not a whole lot of money to get involved and, you know, get blinking lights and beeping buzzers and uh, things like that. And uh, but, you know, there's just a few books that you have to. This book is actually coming out uh, publication date end of the year. If if uh, has anybody been to Derek Malloy's website? Absolutely fantastic website, terrific videos, detailed projects, um, l lots of stuff. I guess maybe lots of Python and C++, but they're, they're very doable projects, easy to follow. And he's got a book coming out, which, you know, if you're at all interested in this, it absolutely is, is worth looking at. So this is actually what we got going on. You can, you can uh, people can try it, you know, and see. So around the classroom, we have 192.168.2. And actually, it's 2.1.2.3.11.13.14.15.16. The, the way you, but the first thing you'd have to do is log into the wireless network. And Stephen, what are the, the names? You see, you see a bunch of wireless networks with kind of similar names in terms of. I think some classroom chalkboard something. Yeah, yeah, that would be an example. Yeah, any of those would be a good. Market or warehouse. Or warehouse fleet. Yeah, yeah, so actually are they independent VLANs or they are in the same big? They're actually in the same big, so they're, don't so, tell anybody that. So, that's, we, so <laughs> that was a little bit of a shortcut. Yeah, so anyway, it's just the same. So anyway, you can actually, you, you can, you should theoretically, theoretically be able to log into any one of them. Yeah, you should be able to. If you log into any one of them, it'll log into the same network, and it'll give you an address in the 192.162. Dot something range, and from there you should be able to SSH into these legal bones. Uh, yeah. So that's that's the other thing, and this is where all hate mayhem breaks loose. But uh, you know, any one of those 192.162.1, you can actually SSH into as root, and you know, and and explore. That's what I'm at. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. It's, so, you know, whatever is on there, you, you can use today, but leave it here. Don't take it with you. It's not, um, it, it's not, there's more on it than should be on it. But. So, just for example, you, you should be able to, I think, SSH into 2.4, 2.5, 7, uh, 7, or 8, or 9. Yeah, or 8, or 9. Just give a shout. If anybody actually gets onto one, has anybody done it yet? Mm. Could you show the IP address again? <coughs> because I just connect you. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. Nice network. I mean over here. 192.168.2. So those IP addresses are assigned by Stephen's DHCP server, which actually is. This is act, this is actually connected to the cloud. We got one one success. Yeah, I got the load up. I see that load up Dart. Oh that's good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, to run it. So run it. So run just take Dart, hello.dart. Uh, I think I said I said a printer here. Yeah, those numbers are quite right. Uh, Fourteen, but four, four, five, seven, eight, nine, maybe eleven, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Should I say dark and hello dark? So I just yeah, dark and then hello dark. Instruments devices. Okay, TI's new hello dark. Yeah. 
Congratulations. So we have a new Dart programmer today, right? There we go. That's good. Good job. Um, uh, it doesn't exactly look like a C program. So just do it, you know, if you just look at it, it's as simple, it's a three line. Yeah, it just exactly looks like a C program. For, yeah, it looks, it looks very, you know, familiar. But the difference is I'm, that... I'm sorry, could, yeah. could, you just, uh, could you just give me the topology again? You have, we're logging into a wireless router. This is actually clear, clear wireless? Yeah, you, you, but that's not basically all of those um, SSIDs that are like office something or warehouse something or market something. They're all um, each, each one of these is advertising its node name, but it's connecting you to the mesh of the 10 or 11 of them with the gateway plugged into a Netgear router, which is handing out the 192.168.2. addresses and handing those out straight through these guys to the Beagle Bones. So you'll get an address in that address space and you'll be able to ping or SSH into these Beagle Bones, uh, which are like five, seven, eight, nine, eleven. Yeah, don't, don't associate with the MIT access point. Right. Mm -hmm. That'll keep that. I, so, I just SSH into one of the boxes. It seems to be running easy with a 3.8 kernel, and so, but it seems that it's a mixture of bigger bounce repositories and office repositories, right? I Say see. that again. It, it seems it's a mixture of what? And the repositories is a mixture of bigger bounce repositories and the official Debian repositories. Oh, really? Good. Yeah. Yeah, and it's running a custom 3.8.13 kernel. Good. Is there a, so there's some oddball stuff in the sources.list? And yeah, I just cat this file and I run the name to say the kernel version. Ah. So so try uh, that is interesting. So you got the wheezy one. There are three wheezies. So if I were to guess fourteen the wheezy. Fourteen. Did you log into Office? Mm -hmm. It doesn't Weezy. matter what you log I into. I think I log into the IP address. To which one? Delivery. Warehouse delivery and. Warehouse delivery. Is right. that which one is that? Is that office warehouse yeah. delivery? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's good. IDs aren't going to lead you to uh, a particular. To, to, well, to, to bigger bone. You know, you, they'll get you to any bigger bone on the network. And he didn't. Uh, he didn't. I think. What's this one here? Give him. Give him this IP address, if you could, please. One with EC. Because that should that should be a Jesse. Yeah, my problem is I don't have five But you can see here. Okay, that's good. So, um, anyways, you know, have at it. If you, if you bang, anybody bang this one in yet? This, this I just lost to fourteen. URL. Everybody's afraid of the vegetables. What's that? Everybody's afraid of the vegetables. Everybody's afraid of the vegetables. Yeah, cabbage, cabbage. Yeah. The veggies always get the least of those. Somebody should try that and see if it. Fourteen. I think it's nine B. Nine B. I think that's nine B. Okay, we'll keep going and, and multitasking here. So this is a, you know kind of a typical project. Uh, Brian, Brian, this is the one he's logged in. Yeah, that's what. It, why did I guess that? I, I, I guess that because these these are the only ones that are running Wheezy. All the others are running Jesse, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, so that was good. So, anyway, anyways, you know, you, you got a lot of jumpers. You got a lot of wires. You you have different you know voltages and stuff like that running around. Uh, on the topic of voltages, uh, public service announcement here. The, the w w one thing about the Beagle Bones is you really have to power these things down. There's a little button to the left of the Ethernet jack. Uh, you have to power it down by pushing that button before you just pull out the power cord on it. Because uh, if you just pull the power cord out on it, it's a, a pretty it's easy. It's an unclean shutdown, right? Just like, just like we don't power off our PCs by plugging out the battery. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, it's it, even worse, it, right? It, it's not. Yeah, it, it, it can be. It can be bad if you just pull yeah, the plug yeah, So, right. so, so don't do it. Um, okay. I just keep going. If you have any questions about MOSFETs or you know transistors or stuff like that. Um, okay. So, so here's one of my conjectures that you know my I wonder about the cloud stuff, right? And so we know that about local internets, which is what we effectively have here, although, you know, by virtue of this, we're also connected to the cloud. But there's a lot of stuff you can do just with local uh, internets, right? So, so, you know, I kind of refer to those as islands. 
And if you string them together, you get kind of an archipelago of things. And then eventually, if you need to connect to the cloud for reasons that you do <coughs> that sort of on an on-demand basis, right? But that's different from uh, always connected, where you're always pinging back and forth. There are efficiency issues there. There are security issues there. There are cost issues there. So the question is, how do you, uh, what are your considerations for system design? And I just think, just to toss it out there, that there are options of local versus interconnected. Uh, another option is wired versus wireless. So this is what the, kind of the test lab setup looks like with at the top there, the red, white, and blue uh, cables or a couple of switches. And the switches are hardwired, uh, interconnects with the beetle bones. And, uh, and, and then this thing on the right here is actually uh, the white thing with rabbit ears is an access point, which is also <coughs> providing uh, the DHCP addresses, right? So in some sense, this could be a configuration of a coffee shop kind of setting where you're giving out IP addresses that people can come in and they can interact with your network, not necessarily with the larger internet, the World Wide Web, but uh, it would at least get access to your network of stuff, whether it's a local library or, you know, you can imagine a bunch of different scenarios. Anyways, with uh, Stephen's help particularly, we said, okay, great, we know this works. Let's, and you can see these are basically the different uh, mounting plates for, for the, the four mounting plates for the, the beetle bones. Let's pull the wires out and put a mesh network in. And that's what we have here. And there's less trip, tripping involved and, and stuff like that. Um, okay, this was, this was the, it's a little bit out of place here, but it, it's worth maybe just taking a minute to speed read this. <coughs> yeah, there's a, so there's, there's a couple of different fixes for this. Yeah. So, the Android community is going to eventually use the same kernel as Linux. And, and the Android community is the one that loves ARM. I mean, ARM hasn't made much of a penetration into into traditional PC markets. Actually, I think the situation of ARM chips are even worse than the PC markets by then, because at that time, when the PC starts to emerge, at least there's something they can follow. Like there's a universal BIOS, which is copied from IBM. But not ARM, it seems that every device has its own way of bootstrap. Yeah. And every device has its own definition of the chips, because and th their own motherboard, so. I know when Linux is annoying because sometimes if you maybe merge the two different fixes, it will simply crash. Yeah. So, so the good news about this, at least my understanding and my experience, is that this actually led to the good work that's been done and the adoption of the device tree stuff, so that this actually is much less of an issue today than it was then. To a point where we see chips coming out of China that are getting thumbs up from people who really are in the know about this stuff, that they're basically coming across real clean, yeah. and they just marry to the latest versions of the kernel. You know, MediaTek, <coughs> well, I, I think MediaTek is one of the vendors, and yeah. I used to know a little about modified firmware for my Android phones, which use MediaTek, and yeah. they actually cannot compile the whole Android system, they only compile the upper layer. And have to use the stock firmware provided by whatever the vendor, for example, Lenovo. Yeah. Because it's a mess if you try to configure it by yourself. So I would say the good news from this is that the world is a much better place. And Kurt, you've been kind of an ARM uh, enthusiast for a long time. But from the standpoint of using stock Linux cross-platform kernel, much better off today. And the stuff that is installed on these, these Beagle bones is essentially using the cross-platform. So they're all running stock kernel without patches, is, except some of the configuration changes? Right, so the, 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 the question about the patches, without this guy Robert Nelson, who uh, I, I acknowledge at the outset, it's pretty amazing the, the, the stuff that he knows and the stuff that he's involved with. So my understanding is essentially, he, he is, uh, he's out there on the front lines with these beagle bones, and, as, and he continues to test with the earliest Beagle Bones that were shipped, but as uh, new versions of Debian come out, or, you know, for instance, Dart. Dart did not run, 
I got I compiled Dart maybe a year and a half or so ago on the BeagleBone through a very arduous and involved process with some uh, helpful advice from uh, a couple of ARM developers at Google who were very helpful. So I could get it compiled once, but it just was, uh, you know, uh, or twice or three times. Anyways, what he's done is he's made, he's got it compiling on both Wheezy and Jesse. And as fixes are being, for instance, one of the things, uh, the version is 1.6 and 1.7 of Dart, right? And uh, Jesse, which is the forthcoming version of Debian, has moved to a new version of the GCC compiler, which you may know. I guess. Right. Which a, a few people may know. Uh, and you think, well, of course, everything should run. Well, it, it, it recompile. Problem is, everything doesn't. So it turns out that, uh, that Dart 1.7 compiles kind of you know, easily on, on Jesse as well as um, it can be run on, on Wheezy. But 1.6 is a little trickier. So what Robert and probably other people are doing, they're in this loop of as fixes are being made, they're essentially moving them upstream so that eventually, probably sometime in 2015, all is, it takes, it seems, six to nine months for cycle for, for these fixes to get picked up, right? Hey, uh, but the good news is it's, 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 it's all moving in the right direction as far as that goes. Uh, there's, there are a couple of good rants out there, but uh, they're not suitable for playing in public uh, forums. But anyways, I definitely encourage you to check those out. Uh, but the good news is really significant strides have been made from an architectural standpoint that makes the adoption of new ARM-based chipsets uh, much friendlier with the latest kernel. And from the standpoint of adoption of uh, new devices and new hardware, it's all headed in the right direction. There's more stuff on that. I don't, do people know what the file system hierarchy standard is? Right, so one guy, you said, what, what is it? I think it defines how every directory works. Right. For example, the older version of FHS does not have slash user slash lib exec, I guess, and it's then been merged into the standard by now. I know this because our project, our older version, our old, the stable version does not allow this directory to exist, but our development tree was are starting to loosen up to allow apps to be installed into this directory because the FHS has updated. Yeah, yeah. So, does, so does everybody just subscribe to this now? I mean, I still have software that wants to install it slash opt, and I'm not sure where that's um, coming from. I install a bunch of apps into opt to make sure that it does not conflict with the apps I have. So I think opt is defined in the FHS for user-based applications, much like slash user slash for local. Okay. So again, I think the good news is that the tide is shifting in this direction in a pretty significant way, and certainly, you know, Deb Debian adheres to this. So the question I had, this, the way this came up was, well, so what is this Debian that's on the BeagleBot currently, right? And and because it has a different user interface, the the, the BeagleBones. The ones that we've got uh, around here, most of the interact SSH, you're, you're jumping into it that way, right? So it's, it's the command line console stuff. But they also have a user interface, a lightweight kind of user interface for running a browser or something like that. So what, but it's very different than what I have on my Ubuntu. Yeah, you, you have something like normal Unity. You have a full X of work, I guess. Right, right. So, so but, but the commonality of what makes Debian Debian, apart from all the processes and procedures and sources and the app get, is uh, at least this is a minimal sort of compatibility layer that all devices should have if they're going to be called uh, Debian. Okay, standards are really important. Uh, you know, um, I, it would be interesting to see from an IoT perspective how all this stuff develops. On the one hand, the physical web sounds promising if it's going to rely on sort of, a, you know, everybody knows what URLs are, everybody knows how to interact with URLs. If it doesn't proliferate new sort of new ways and of, of interacting, that would be good to leverage existing standards. Uh, Nmap, people know Nmap, if you got to find out what's on your web, Kurt uh, pointed us in this direction. Uh, I think Nmap is more used to see if your machine has been hacked from uh, another machine or to see if there are security vulnerabilities like unusual ports being opened. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That, that, that's the most thing I do with Nmap. Probably, I guess. Good.
Good, good. Okay, uh, mesh networks, we, we have open mesh here. Stephen has mentioned commotion, which is another one. Meraki <coughs> rooftop, which is, you know, Kurt and Stephen and others were in on. But any other mesh networks that people have heard of or have talked about? Or The beauty of it is that you can so do... There's a fire chat mesh network being set up in Hong Kong Central. Fire chat? Oh, so, so that's the kind of maintain minimum network. It's an alternative network for when the uh, fuzz shuts down the uh, cell system. Yeah, I, I don't know if this counts the mesh so network. The problem is that <laughs> to mesh, it's, it doesn't have any uh, crypto, so... So the government can listen to this easily. They, so they even have SSL? Well, it's a, a self-configuring mesh with security is a hard thing to do. Yes, uh, um, I heard two things. I but yeah, it's scary. Yeah. But at least it means they have some communication. Yeah, I, I think there are, I heard two. One is the OLPC project, uh -huh. where the, every OLPC's network card has been configured to be an extending system, which all the OLPC's can be linked together and finally link to a school's, a school's access point so that the students can use their OLPC tablets or netbooks, whatever, to connect to the school's resources even at home. And another mesh network, I guess this very often is to share an internet connection with the laptop's network card when you, on, you only have a one cable, which is, I think the, the ad hoc network system is, is in every operating system I come across. Mm -hmm. um, how is, is the Comcast people, like they're putting their open DS, um, X20 Wi-Fi? Yeah, they're putting it in every, everywhere. I mean, it, every time I stop at a, at a street light, I mean, at a traffic light, I can see that it's trying to connect to my Comcast network. You know, like, I mean, it's almost becoming a mesh network. Yeah, I think Comcast. every Comcast. Why are they doing it? What's the, I mean, they're putting, my sister had to get a new. They're trying to compete with the cell companies. Yeah. They want to like latch customers onto them. They they want you to use their network. Use their network uh, as opposed to buying cellular data. And if you think you need cellular data for when you're not home, you might decide to cut the cable uh, and only use cellular data even when you are home. So they want to make it possible for you to uh, not buy cellular data. That's what, what I'm doing, actually. I'm not, I, I'm, I have a cheaper cellular plan and I'm, I'm using Comcast all the time. All so Comcast shares a Comcast, and we've noticed that if the, the Comcast router is on, you can start, you can find the X20 Wi-Fi. So I guess every router has been used to create an access point to the central Comcast network. Not every router, but it's becoming a larger percentage, but it's certainly not every. I mean, that's yeah, that's just that's my friends observe that. They contact the Comcast customer saying, we must send you a new router now and you must replace it right away. And, it, and it, the new router is now an open one. Yeah, them. actually the new router, uh, I, I like to call it the modem, contains a new, contains an internal Wi-Fi chip. That's right. It com broadcasts both Comcast X20 Wi-Fi and the home Wi-Fi, which is encrypted. That's exactly what they're doing. They're replacing a lot of their Wi-Fi. How do the cops know whether it was you or somebody uh, on the sidewalk downloading the illegal kitty porn. Well, that's the way you say, hey, I bought the I can't After they kick the door open and grab your stuff with their guns. And shot your dog. Uh, it, 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 shot your dog. Oh, man. It, 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 that's me. That's <laughs> I guess I'm casting. You got a question over here on the right? Yeah, I was under the maybe, impression maybe, the, uh, maybe the Patriot Act, Act covered the uh, Internet Service Providers you specifically have sections. That if you're uh, uh, ISP at large scale, you had to be able to provide login information and tracking if information. If they see Doug anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, explain so Wi-Fi. Right. You have to log in to get in. There yes, is. Yeah. but yeah. will they remember to tell the government that it wasn't you and somebody else when the government wants to know who was doing something they, bad, they, or are they, they going to nail the neighbors? Yeah, and uh, actually, I think they will do if you have been. You have arrested because Comcast did something wrong. You can sue them, right? Yeah, I'd rather not get arrested. 
<laughs> I believe that okay. there's a database with the geographic locations so, of the different So the whole it's networking is a big is a big the subject. Question is, are they competent? We're talking about the government and Comcast. Let, let me uh, move forward a bit. Uh, this is uh, one of the things about IoT is is uh, the ability to interact with sensors of different sorts. And TIs get the sensor tag thing, which is just a little board that has a half a dozen different uh, sensors on it, like a magnetometer and an accelerometer and a thermometer and different things like that. So you stick a battery in it, and and then uh, it, it squawks BLE Bluetooth Low Energy. And it comes with a little sample app that you can do. But I've actually managed to get it connected uh, through Dart and, and Linux command line stuff. Kurt's doing some, some work as well in related areas. So essentially what you do is you, Linux has the commands to talk out Bluetooth, low energy. So you identify what the device ID is. And then you send commands to it. And the commands, it basically has its own little, there's a name for the server. Does anybody know what the name is? On the Bluetooth? You mean the Bluetooth server? Yeah, the Bluetooth server. I think Bluetooth. The Bluetooth stack for Linux kernel is Bluetooth, I guess, and it's used as a system service. So, so it, it's system service, and it's got its own kind of little means for communicating, of basically doing not much more than setting bits and returning bits and, and giving you the results of that stuff. But, but the thing is, the idea is that uh, there are established pathways for interacting with Bluetooth devices. Not widely used, I'd say. Uh, the other stuff that's going on in the industry uh, in, uh, Alliance Realignment, Broadcom pulled out of this Open Interconnect Consortium. W was it a big deal? Is it a small deal? Uh, was it over IP or some other things? Who knows? But people are still trying to essentially jockey for uh, for a position on this survivor game of I Internet of Things. We talked about the shutdown procedures uh, and, oops. Excuse me, did I say Broadcom on um, last slide? Yeah. So the, 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 there, are a hand, there are several big alliances that have been set up, ostensibly <coughs> with the focus of Internet of Things. So there's the Open Internet Connect Consortium, there's the All Seen uh, Alliance, and then uh, and, you know, and different companies are jumping on to different ships. The, the, the opportunity is that you get people focused on the same thing, and they'll come together. It's kind of how Android got going, right? Lots of companies got on board with the Android stuff. And the downside is that if they promulgate new, different, uh, incompatible standards that, that requires people to get new hardware and routers and all kinds of stuff, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of a perilous route to go for, for users. Uh, I know people are interested in this stuff, but you just got to know your electronics when you put together these little projects, whether it's Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone or uh, Arduino seems much, much more... Uh, resilient to some of these things because maybe it's simpler and less complex. But uh, Dart VM. Uh, so, so the other thing about Dart, it's, it's essentially an interpretive scripted language. So you can, you know, you just type in hello and, and, and run the hello Dart and, and it runs it. But actually, what it does is it compiles the script down into. Uh, um, it, it's 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 a virtual machine, so yeah. it's not you know, and it's it is it's just like Java, JIT system, or something like that. It's similar, in, in fact, that, you know, if you look at the names of the people who are working on the, the Dark VM, uh, there's a fair number who have some background in these other JITs that you might be familiar with, right? Uh, so, and the beauty of the, the virtual machine is that you can move it from machine to machine, platform to platform, pretty quickly and pretty easily. And, and the people who are developing this language, they know how to make stuff go fast, efficiently, and it's a very robust and, and uh, language as well. Uh, there, there are lots of you know little cheat sheets. I'm going to write up a little blog post that will summarize the details. So if anybody really kind of want to get in, and I've, I've cobbled together over the period of months and, and devices uh, a lot of the, the shortcuts or a lot of just the long cuts on how to do things. And so not to burden people with it today, but uh, oh, so, so this is a summary of the different Debian images that are available for the beagle bone, right? And so you can't really read it, but uh, they come in different flavors, and you can update the devices in different ways. Typically, you save the image to an SD card, micro SD card, you stick it in, and then uh, you boot the, the device, 
and it automatically goes to the SD card and flashes the, the device with whatever. Some of these devices have two gig drives on board and some of them have four gig drives on board. The, the two gig aren't quite big enough to get a full desktop. desktop. Yeah, I, I noticed that four gig has an LXD inside. Right, right. So, so, so the, with the four gig, which is sort of what, uh, along with the four gig devices, which the big long blacks came out, that they that allowed them to do a few more things. But anyways, th th there's like a handful of different uh, uh, device, uh, different configurations that you can install from the command line all the way up to sort of a full rich user experience. Yeah. So I actually wonder, is it possible that the big bone can to attach a SATA control to big bone and I attach something like a hard drive? Yeah, you certainly can. Yeah. You you you, uh, you 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 can attach hard drives and, and yeah. Is there yeah. SATA? Uh, I don't know if it has a SATA controller. So SATA. So on on the Jetson board, if you put SATA on there, you also have to plug in the big honk and five volt power connector. Yeah. The Beagle one does not have SATA. Beagle one. So uh, not too many of these dev boards do. Yeah, I, uh, and I don't think four gig is quite enough to kind of actually boot off external storage. Yeah. I know Raspberry Pi can only boot off external storage. I don't think this one can. Mm. Well, in terms of, it can boot off of the SD. So for instance, one of the configurations was booting off the SD rather than flashing it to, I don't know if they still do that. I assume they do, but. Here, I don't see any SD card slots, so is it? Yeah, yeah it's hard to, it's to hard to see, but they're, oh, it's it's the side, yeah. they're on the other side. Yeah. Full size, full size SD? No. Uh, no, it's micro SD. Oh. It's, the, it's, like, it's like what you put in your phone, right? I know. So, so you know, with 32 gig, and, and again, these aren't really designed to be the things that you're going to do your doctoral thesis on, in my view. On the other hand, th there's a tremendous amount that, you know, just because of the user interface and stuff like that. On the other hand, the browsing experience on the BeagleBone from one person who I observed do it a week ago was like, wow, it's better than I thought than I expected. Uh, yes. So, so this is, it's all on the web. These builds are being updated frequently. Some, I think Jesse's being built maybe daily and Easy's being built weekly, uh, less frequently. There are lots of notes here which I'll fold into the, the blog posting. Uh, we talked about the, the changes, there are lots of subtle nuances that thankfully people who are, are close to the process kind of keep up with it. Um, I asked the, 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 the guy, Robert Nelson, so because he refers to it as the console, the thing that's the community, the thing that used to be like, you know, MS DOS, right? That, that basically there's a console equivalent. And, and so I asked him, well, what, you know, why'd you call it the console? To, 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 uh, so, but that actually is. A, a distribution of the Debian underlying code, but it essentially only gets you to the console. Now, it, the, the beauty of the, the Debian system is you can then go ahead and build your, roll your own configuration of uh, additional applications that you want to have installed. Not a big deal. It's pretty yeah. easy to do. Does this people want to use a proprietary bootloader or just simply use this program? I don't think it's proprietary, but you're kind of uh, beyond my, my grasp on some yeah, of this so. stuff. So, for instance, uh, I'm pretty sure it's just essentially compatible yeah. with, with what's, and there are different, that's a little bit beyond. One, I will say this, though, that back to the device tree discussion that we had earlier, for the, uh, the companies that hadn't yet created the device blob of sorts, it was developed in such a way that effectively it would still run with the newer kernels that came out. It kind of repositioned where it thought that blob might be and, and, uh, and kept going. Th this picture is mostly here just to show the power switch up there below the uh, Ethernet connector. You just got to kind of push it down until the lights go out. We should, we should do one here just, for the, uh, just to see. So I've never shocked myself or electrocuted anyone, but you have to hold it down for you know maybe I don't know ten seconds or something like that, and and once the lights all go out, okay, so it's out. That means it's shut off. Now, the the the, the kind of small breakthrough I had earlier t today actually with and then just to turn it on, it's a very simple thing, and you'll see how it boots up when the four LED lights come on. They start flickering, and then it's going out and searching for uh, the network, but. Well, all these devices are now configured so that when they boot up, 
they boot the, the, the Dart web server, and they boot right into those little mini applications. Did anybody see the veggies yet? Did you get to the veggies? I did. I did. did you get to them? Yeah. You did, so they're there. They're good for you. Um, so the, this was the, this was the uh, anyways, if you go to the veggies, the, you'll eventually see them. But, um, okay, central tag, realignment, we talked about that. Oops, we want to resume. But, you know, so you really don't, you want to shut it down. Oh, so the point is that now these little devices are configured so that uh, when they reboot, they, they essentially launch a useful application with some utility to, to you know to me, and it might be just something simple as the, to keeping track of the a barometer, thermometer kind of situation. It might be a doorbell, it might be a video camera, uh, a lot a lot of different things. Uh, this is how we set the classroom up, more or less. The, the the classroom nodes I think we're in this area, the warehouse SSID, the the market is actually up here on this one. They're blinking wildly, so. Uh, if somebody was on the market one, we could shut it down and see how long it took to come back. This, this was, we've talked a lot about this, uh, that, that as of Debian 8, Jesse, which is actually forthcoming, November, early November, something like that, it, it no longer ships multiple kernel flavors for the ARM HF ports, which is what we're talking about here. Uh, and it's shipping these multi-platform kernel flavors. So I think this is really significant in the sense that it'll be much easier for the vendors and their multitudes of ARM chip vendors to basically ship products uh, with, with greater frequency. Talked about GPIO. Uh, this is what I was actually talking about, I think, a little earlier you know, sort of about where the images are on boot up, but unless you're really hardcore about this stuff, you, uh... okay, so there's that. Any questions? And I'm just going to connect up the Dart IDE, and we can look at a little bit of code and, and, uh, and see how that looks. So I, I personally don't think this, this may be opinion rather than, than anything based on fact. I don't think anybody that adopts the ARMv8 for whatever they need the ARMv8 to do for them is ever going to revisit ARMv7. There's a billion platforms with ARMv7, ARMv7 out there because we've been waiting for three years for ARMv8 to hit the streets. But for people who need 64-bit ARM processors, I don't see what you could possibly. So, so uh, Jesse, that, that's that's all fine and dandy for Debian. You can have ARMmp, and, and I, I know right now when you do a kernel compile on these things. You got a choice of about a thousand different ARM options, but I don't think if, if you're an ARM, if you're a 64-bit ARM person, you'll ever be doing any of that. It'll be, it'll be, you go into your your kernel compile, it'll say do you want x86 or you know ARM. x64 or ARM. Yeah, it won't, it, it won't be the hassle that, that, that Linus was talking about. So most of the times the things are cross compatible, right? Uh, yeah, right now, yeah. Maybe yeah, but because I can't. Imagine compiling a kernel on Beagle. Uh, Beagle. Yeah, yeah because <laughs> even even this one which has a core two processor, it might take two hours to compile a working kernel. Really? Yeah, this is a refer based style, so it has it's only a ULV processor. Uh. <laughs> yeah, the the beauty of a lot of this stuff <coughs> is that you can do cross compile. Yeah. You know, and and Ubuntu in particular, I don't know as much about Debian, but I've had success compiling lots of stuff. I mean, two, three, four, we were compiling Chrome OS, do you remember? I, we had that meeting, and, and uh, you know, so there's a lot, of course, that was probably... How long did it take to compile for Chrome OS? It's, we did it in the, in the time span of the meeting, but it was x86 actually at the time, so uh, that's a bit of a cheat, but... Okay, so here's the, the Dart uh, IDE. It's very simple to install Dart. You go to dartlang.org, and they've got packages, zip files. Um, <coughs> I've done. Uh, it looks like Eclipse, actually. It's it's built it's built on Eclipse, right? And so you get people who do have sort of religious reactions to uh, to this stuff. Some people love it. Some people don't. Some people like their own uh, sort of you know tools to to work with, and and all this stuff you can do from a text file, right? It's just it's code, and then you can run it, and you just jump out and run it. But the comfort of having 
you know, error messages show up. Yes, I don't know why I think you disconnected the projector. I don't know why I keep doing that. But, um, so I'm not showing you this to, to, but basically what you have over here on the, on the left hand side is you've got projects, right? And you got a, and, and actually, so it's, it's kind of interesting. I'll, so this project here, CAM server, is uh, uh, basically what it does is it goes out and it grabs images from webcams and then it shares them over uh, you know, a local area network, right? And then this other application, which is ViewCams, so that's a server application. This other application, which is ViewCams, is a client-side application. And I'll, I'll, the way you run it is, well, I'll run them. Just go up here, and it's nothing's hooked up right, so you will see lots of errors, which is good. But uh, at least you'll get a, you, get, you do get some right <coughs> off the bat. Okay, so it started out here. We get some messages. It knows when it's turned it on and stuff like that. What it's doing right now is actually, it's just jumped out and it's run a Linux process to find out how much a disk storage is available because the, the, the biggest headache for me, particularly with images, is of course you, <coughs> you populate your disk pretty quick, right? Yes, that's really something that you have can do a job, right? Yeah, exa exactly. So, so, so what this has done is this has jumped out. It's done that Linux command. It sucked the input, the results from it, back into Dart. It's processed it. It's actually scanned through the results and it said, okay, disk space used is 3%. Kind of makes it look like it's a, it's a dark command, but it's not. It's a Linux command that's essentially parsed in dark. And then, if this percentage of disk space used exceeds a certain level, it can go out and it can essentially list, list what files are on the disk, do a chronological sort, and then, and then tidy it up and run a, a Linux command to clean it up and then feed the results back into dark. So even though uh, all those capabilities, and, and, and to do that, it's, you know, it's, I don't know, 15 lines of code. To do that in C or C++, or it's, it's days worth of code, right? So, so, so anyways, what this is, now this is off and it's, it's, it's running a web server, basically. But let's, let's do this. Uh, well, okay, so that's clearly a server application, right? Now, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you said that at the moment this is this is acting as a web server at the same time? Yeah. Yeah, because start can be used to start a website just like Node. I don't know that, sorry. So actually, I should, let me sh let, let's show you the, the web server bit just so you get a sense of what is involved because... So it is a lot like Node. So my, Microsoft's competitor to the physical web is called Project Nitrogen, and that's all Node.js. They actually use Node. I thought they would, they would use Stuff.net or something like that. Yeah, they're, um, yeah. They're so this is just to kind of show you real quickly. Uh, so this is how you instantiate a web server in Dart. You see that thing up there, HTTP server dot bind. So you're binding a web server, which is code that they have provided, uh, to, and 000 says, I want to hear the traffic on <coughs> any, any incoming port, whether it's a local host or for, for, you know, from any place. And, and uh, 8888 is the, is the port that we're going to listen specifically on, right? And then it goes out, it does this thing, it creates a virtual directory uh, in my root path, and that's where I'm storing uh, files, right? So if you, it, it allows you to, it's like the way you can do it on web servers, static files and process them more efficiently. I guess. Okay. And then, and then what we, we jump in here and we start to listen to the server you, and you get requests that come in over the wire. And then based on what those requests, the request is just the data structure that we start to peel apart into its meaningful elements, such as uh, what path is he looking for? Well, in this case, I've got a command from over the web to shut things off, and I send it in via this slash off. So, uh, or if I want to turn things on, then I, <coughs> if I want to just get the version number, I look into this request document that comes in over the HTML stuff. It's, uh, all this is, is, you know, it's object-oriented programming, all these things are objects, and so they have the, the, the component elements, in this case, there's a URI element, with a URI, URI uh, object or element. There's also a path, and the path tells you what it came in from. And so that essentially is the mechanism by which I've 
started to set this up so that the web application controls the pins on the Beagle Bone. So you can imagine it sends a command to the Beagle Bone server. The Beagle Bone server then simply, as we talked about, runs a little Python application that jumps out, sets a pin, gets a pin, pulls it back in, and kind of feeds it back up the hierarchy. Okay. So you, anyways, you asked about the web server, but pretty much, you know, this one page of code gets you a web server. And, and you know, you can do that Python, right? And you can do it with other languages. Uh, Ruby is something that, uh, that, you know, was sort of an early interest of mine. This is very performant. You get, in my, you know, in my, particularly running on a beagle bone, right? You get, you get good performance. So, so, so anyways, that's what a web server looks like. And then, we, we, and which is clearly a, a server side application, right? Okay. So we, we went in and we ran. Nothing you've already ran a view cam, I guess. What's that? Nothing you've already ran a view cam. Yeah, I think you're right. Okay. So what I did is, is um, so here what this is, there, there isn't all the stuff on it, and I'm not going to go into it, but actually if you see up on the upper left, alarms off, alarms on, if you, if you click that, well, let's click that, and we'll see what, uh, well, actually, we, that, that would be a good thing to do. We, uh-oh. <coughs> what we could, well, here, let's do You do have semicolons, so you know the the <laughs> one nice thing is you don't have the the uh, the white space issues of Python, which is sort of you know my nightmare. I don't know if we do this. this. What I wanted to do is I wanted to show you the sort of some of the debugging stuff, but oh, actually we can do it right here. Let's see. Great request. Okay. So so yeah, let's get rid of that. So what I did here was I just double clicked in the left column. You saw I put a little blue dart in a blue dot in there. And let's see if we run this again. Will it will it stop when we it should, but let's see what happens. I'm not quite sure why it did. Well, we'll maybe we'll come back to it. I'm, um, anyway, so so what what happened here was when we ran the the client side application, it launched a browser, and the browser that it launched is, they refer to as Dartium. Okay, so it's essentially a modified version of Chromium, and it's got the Dart VM embedded in it. This is a pretty simple but complex concept. So everybody knows that the browsers have a JavaScript yeah. interpretive engine. I remember that Google created Dart to partially or eventually replace JavaScript because of performance. It has a better performance. So, so, so um, a couple reasons. In order not to alienate the massive JavaScript community that's out there, right? I think people never really took the position to say that we're going to replace JavaScript. I think some of the motivations uh, for Dart development... Has anybody... Who have de who's developed in JavaScript? It's like a couple. So, so from my limited experience, there's a really good book out there. I think Crockford is the guy who wrote it, the JavaScript, The Good Parts. Anybody seen that? And, and this, this guy, is, he's, uh, he's a Yahoo guy. Uh, you know, I think he's the guy I met on Jason. And, and, uh, and he focuses on, the, the concentrates on the parts of JavaScript that are really robust and reliable. The problem is there are a lot, and I seem to find them all, of dark, deep, scary uh, <coughs> corners in JavaScript that you can get lost pretty quick. And you can do things, it will do things for you, which is powerful, but maybe not what you intended. So I think part of the objective in, in Dart, particularly for larger scale uh, JavaScript applications, is to have a more robust development environment that's reliable for people to work on scale projects. And so I think that's a big motivator. Clearly other motivations are uh, performance related as well, right? So what happens here though is that in this case, it launched uh, a, a custom version of, of Dartium. Now that's nice because that version has the Dart VM 
embedded in it. They've taken that VM engine that knows how to interpret the, the Dart commands, the, the Dart language, natively. That's what Dart is. But for so, so you mean the Dart is embedded into the HTML page just like JavaScript? In, uh, yes, in correct. This application. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so, so in this application, actually, what the what what is running, the commands that are running are these commands, which look, they don't look a whole lot like JavaScript, right? Uh, they look, as you said, more like C. Right. So, so, but what happens here is when these commands run, they access libraries that understand <coughs> the browser hierarchy. They execute those library commands, and then they give you a page that looks like a browser page. But what if you're uh, running this from Explorer? You know, you're an Explorer user, and you want to run a, an application. You just go to the, one of these beagle bones, and all you want to do is access the server. Well, Explorer doesn't have Dart or anything like Dart. So the manner in which that's addressed is there's a command here. And we'll just show how, how easy and quick it really is. And let me do this. I, I somehow lost my layout here. I got it back, sort of. Yeah. So, so here, let's say that we want to take the ViewCams application and we want to build it. They have a, a sort of an, a concept. We've got it right here. It's build view cams, but I'm going to get actually it'll it'll I changed the name on that. So what you do is you basically uh, build the application, and in the same way that a compiler will build C into object code, whatever it it will. Uh, build and we'll eventually see it. Uh, it will build the code as JavaScript, right? And then what you do is you take that JavaScript and that's what you deploy to the server. So even though you've developed the application in Dart, you've essentially you've built it into JavaScript. You take that JavaScript application, you put it up on your server wherever it may be, and Explorer users, uh, you know, they just see it as a web application. Now. The advantage potential down the road of Chromium is, you know, integrating the Dark VM in the same way that Google made. I don't know if people follow the V8 project, the, essentially the JavaScript, you, you know, yes. redesign and rewrite, where uh, a team of people at Google, and it was great for about a year or two. They watched, you know, they publicized the performance improvements of the V8 engine over the other JavaScript engines over a period of a couple of years. It, dramatic. It, multiple, multiple times faster. Uh, so, so the same promise holds for Dart being integrated potentially into browsers, which is that you can have a more robust and more performant uh, language eventually that speaks native. So, yeah. So does Dart have a sandbox or how are you, how are you creating access to the system files? When I assume Dart runs on the local system. Yep. And JavaScript has protection so you can't access the file structure and change things in the system. Yep. What's Dart got? Same, same, all that same stuff. Using the same structures? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, I mean, sometimes if you want to dig into it, you know, Dart's got this concept of zones, which I, I haven't dug into. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, essentially, the, the, uh, they've, they know security <laughs> and yeah. they know how to do this stuff, right? So, so uh, it's, it's nice to get a mechanism in place where, where processes can talk to each other, but it's all funneled and channeled and really very clean. So uh, I guess another question, though, is are you asking, can you run JavaScript and Dart side by yeah, side? More, more along the lines of how good is their security? Y yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd bet money on it. But, but Dart runs in a virtual machine after all, I guess. Mm -hmm. I th you know, and again, we're, we're sort of, I'm, I'm beyond my, uh, my camp, but... I mean, Dart's running a virtual machine, so um, if the Chromium sure. team, I, I so if the Chromium team knows the trade, they should have jailed it. Just yeah, like yeah, 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 I, I don't... The key word is should have, there's been problems in the past where they haven't gotten it as well as they want. Yeah. 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 I think it's pretty well, the stuff is pretty well documented, mm -hmm. if you, if you are, I mean, the, at least based on my distant uh, observation, independent observation. If it's useful for everything you want, it's going to have holes. 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, See, so if you can write JavaScript, you can use JavaScript to write a text editor like GitHub Atom, then you can definitely use it to export your system. Mm -hmm. Yes. I've seen, you know, I've seen in, in the, it's, it's open so anybody can follow it. Uh, I've seen in the trail of interaction, there's a lot of interaction and a pretty active developer community, I would say. People are not expressing concerns about that sort of stuff. Uh, so which which might mean that that's a problem area, but I actually think it's just they get the world's best people working on this stuff. Yeah, but if you find if you find like holes in it, or if you have questions on it, unbelievably responsive in terms of uh, acknowledging questions that are asked and pointing in directions for answers. So and if and if there are shortcomings, at least from everything I've seen, people jump on it, especially stuff like security. Mm -hmm. I believe. Some fairly large. In fact, it was it was headline news just recently that their uh, Google has a polling or, or a public reporting of of election results application, pretty big deal. And it was I think recently rewritten in Dart. Well, Bash the Bash bug is an excellent example. Yeah, yeah. It's been around for decades. The Nobody Bash. Found it. Yeah. And I remember that there's not only one shell shock. I guess ten of them. And on my machine, I've. I think I only fixed two, so... Yeah, well, there's only one that was really a remote execution problem. The second one was a remote uh, denial of service, and the rest of them are really just local problems. I remember that the first batch bug had a patch, but the patch is incomplete that by altering the code a little there bit... There were multiple bugs, but yeah. only one of them was a remote code execution problem. Which can which, which, is, which is the one that was the real shell shock. Right. There are a bunch of other related things that have to do with fuzzing input to the yes. shell. I remember that even then I had the same problem and I tested on my Windows box. The, CMD had the, the same this problem. Was the, and this was the topic of the presentation last night, which you were all invited to, so we can keep going. Great. Um, so to, to show, this is, uh, they, they have a tech, technique for uh, sharing and importing libraries, which is really good. Works both on the server kind of console apps as well as the client apps, they've moved to a, a, a sort of an architectural design where they have kind of a core, similar to Linux in some sense I suppose, a, a core, core set of libraries and kernel stuff that they continue to chew on, but then uh, elements that they can sort of put external to the core, they can uh, innovate at it, it, it its own rate, uh, they've put them into, into libraries. And, and they have this uh, pub system for, like for instance, this is the arguments library. This is the thing that when you launch a Dart application, you can pass in arguments just like you can in Linux. And this helps you pull out the arguments. In a, so that's not part of the core uh, language, but it's part of, so the HTTP server that we just, we talked about, that's a library unto itself, right? So it's not part of the, the core engine. Uh, and, and some of these other things, like actually one of the applications I have here, when it does certain things, it's like I want it to send me a text message, right? So there's a library that does that uh, pretty neatly, right? Or, or it sends you an email, right? And so you can set things up. So what you do is you pick out the libraries that you want, and then up here on the right, you, uh, you get them. And what it does is it goes out to, kind of like AppGet or, you know, one of those project, uh, package management applications, it pulls them down and then you have them locally. And then when you uh, build the application for deployment, as we talked about with the client or for a web browser app, or the same is true of the server, no normally a lot of this stuff will be linked in if you're working on a development in a development mode, but when you want to deploy it, it actually pulls all those applications in. And then, there's, I haven't done any of this stuff, but uh, dependencies and versioning, there's a lot of cool stuff where you can say, okay, bundle in this range of versions or work with this range of, of versions. Uh, for me, it's just like pull the latest stuff and it always seems to work. So I think that's about it for the, the coverage of, we covered kind of the, the BeagleBone stuff, we covered the mesh networking stuff. Uh, we did get to see the veggies, at least, on a couple of... We did get somebody to run a Hello uh, Dart program, which was pretty cool. Um, what else? Are there any questions on... So, so the... Sorry. So still for Bitcoin itself, 
there's maybe a, what I'm thinking about all the socks we have is that is, is this going to get really hot? Say that again? Is the device going to get really, really hot? No. no. Uh, you know, for, from, you mean in terms of just general operation? Yeah. No, no, I haven't come close to burning myself. But on these. They're, they're, I did, you know, this, we talked about this actually, uh, Kurt and I, on, on, so I put a, a watt meter on it, it's like 7 watts or something like that, right? Well, of the beagle bone with, you know, USB devices and, and all sorts of stuff. I think the spec is like close to 2 watts. So, but the point is that, uh, you know, how much of the 7 watts is due to the inefficiency of the, of the power cords I have, right? So I think if you were to take, and, and one of my interests here is, is, uh, is DC computing applications for, you know, whether it's solar powered or, or battery powered or what, and you just, you'll, you'll have a much pure lower, uh, lower energy drain. But they're, they're, you know, they're not very... Uh, so, so there's not something like our laptop which can get unbearably hot. Right, right. Again, you're you're uh, you know you're not talking lots of cores, you're not talking lots of, but it, is it? Does somebody know offhand what the speed is on the the Beagle Bone? For some reason, I think is it is it eight or a gig? The older ones, I think, were But it's 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 a pretty a pretty zippy. Yeah, pretty fast because my cell phone has one point five gig. Yeah, yeah. I think the good news. I hope the good news is we'll see more and more of these. Uh, these two. Oh, so one thing we didn't talk about, uh, somehow it escaped us, uh, Thread, which is a uh, protocol. Have people heard of Thread? Thread? Th what's Thread? Thanks. Uh, maybe you mean the multi-thread, right? Oh, uh, close, but that's, that's okay, but not that. That's not what I meant. But, <laughs> you, but Thread, so this, there are three. Bad, you know, in that sense, it's... Um, it's uh, Bad search engine optimization. Ha have people heard of, of uh, you, you know, Nest is, right? The Nest thermostat? So, yeah. so this yeah. thing that, that Google bought, right? So, so um, I developed a lot of it was developed locally. I think I actually. Think that's good. Oh, never mind. I thought Zoom was locked because it was steamy. Uh, this is a nice. By the way, I uh, I just got this Inspiron and uh, it runs Ubuntu pretty good and it actually dual boots on some other operating systems as well. So, but, but anyway, so Thread is the protocol that was used in the Nest thermostat, as I understand it, which is a mesh-like, they, they felt that they needed to come up with a lightweight protocol for communicating between devices, say, in the home. And, and so, you know, Wi-Fi, for instance, is a protocol, right? Pretty heavyweight protocol, there's a lot of stuff that you gotta do. Um, and the, the, the chips, there's a reason they came out with Bluetooth low energy, right? So that the, you could communicate at at uh, at a lower energy. So it's actually a thread right. similar to something like M MPI, which using in HPC. I mean, um, the message MPI or something like that. Right. right. So so, so that, between devices. So so it's it's communication between devices. Whether it's Zigbee, people heard of Zigbee. If you know something, in, it, it, is is it kind of you know bigger than BLE, but smaller than Wi-Fi, somewhere in around Zigbee kind of stuff. Anyways, th there is a thread consortium that has uh, spun up out on the, the West Coast for, for, and they've had their first couple of organizing meetings. And the idea is to get uh, a technology where you can have a lightweight, essentially mesh network I, is, is what it sounds like to me, at least at this point. Where you could have a chip doesn't draw a lot of power or energy. You want you don't want that heat problem. You want long battery life. Uh, on the other hand, you you probably are not going to be streaming, you know, Netflix videos across this protocol. You just basically want to send lightweight information point to point to point. So it's likely that we, I would think we'll see devices like this, these one computer, you know, one board computers that have a different kind of communications technology from Wi-Fi, but they can, but the claim with Thread is that essentially it's compatible with, with uh, the IP stack, so that it can find its way up through all the typical routes of communication that we have today. It's not orthogonal to that, which is, which is hopefully a good thing. So Thread, watch it, you know, probably within the next six months to a year. It'll start showing up in in products. I, I would expect, and and it's 
I think the intent is for it to be an open source kind of, you know, IEEE standard, hopefully, eventually. Any other questions or any questions at all? You're going to do the device tree uh, special interest group afterwards and show them how it all works? All right, John, I think, uh, Kurt, are we done? Stephen, thank you very much for setting all this. If you, we'll leave this set up for a little bit if you have questions or just want to, you know, try and feel the heat temperature on these things, you can do that. Thanks very much, John.